Will you turn with me in God's word, please, to Acts and chapter 7, toward the end of that chapter. Acts and chapter 7. The last couple of times that we've been in the book of the Acts, we have been considering this sermon that was preached before the Sanhedrin by Stephen. We've worked our way through his dealings with the patriarchs, and then to Moses, uh, the great bulk of the sermon. And we pick up this evening in verse 44. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who found favour before God and asked to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophet says, Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit, as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. Let's pray. Father, give us hearts that will now submit to your truth as these Pharisees would not. Give us, O oh God, a humility to hear your word and to recognise the sovereign grace in your dealings with sinful men. Father, may we not ever fall into the traps that are being exposed here, but always honour you in our hearts and with our speech. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. We've said before that this is the single longest recorded speech in the whole of the book of the Acts of the Risen Jesus Christ. And it is in many respects a seminal sermon coming at a key point and making uh, particular assertions and bringing certain arguments, the echoes of which you will find repeated all the way through the book as a whole. It is both defensive and offensive, uh, not offensive in the sense that it's designed to offend, but it both rebuts the charges that have been made against Stephen and lays charges at the feet of the Sanhedrin. And the issue is really the word and the presence of God with his people. That's what Stephen has been accused about. That's what the sermon addresses. And that's what comes to prominence as we rise to this climax. Stephen is a true Israelite. He's a true Israelite according to the flesh. And he's a true Israelite according to faith. Stephen is a son of Abraham indeed. And what he gives here is a, a very proper presentation of the old covenant working into the new covenant in accordance with his audience. Stephen is interpreting the history of Israel as a man who knows God in Christ Jesus. Stephen is the man here who is handling the Old Testament as it ought to be handled, learning the lessons, tracing out the themes, bringing them to their proper conclusion. Some have said, as we've mentioned before, that the sermon has nothing of Christ in it. 
I would contend that the sermon is full of Christ, just not lying openly on the surface. His name does not appear. He is identified as the just one in the section that we have read. But the whole sermon is carrying us toward Jesus Christ. The sermon only makes sense if Jesus Christ lies at the end of the journey that the sermon carries us on. And it's worth remembering, and there's a, a tantalising hint of possibility here at the end, that Stephen probably didn't finish the sermon he had to preach. They gnash their teeth and rush at him before he can come to a proper conclusion. But as far as he gets, this is the point where the challenge really begins to bite in the Sanhedrin. Remember, their accusations against Stephen had to do with the law and the temple. This man, chapter 6 and verse 13, this man Stephen does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. So, the temple and the law. These are the great points of contention. And Stephen has been demonstrating that historically Israel did not recognise the leaders that God gave them, who spoke God's truth to them, nor did they realise God's presence with them even when they possessed it. And now he comes to the point where he brings the past right up to date into the present. He's considered the way that God dealt with Abraham and with Joseph and then back to Jacob. He spent time considering the way that the Lord God led Moses, the great hero of the Sanhedrin, whom Stephen has demonstrated that he, Stephen, knows, understands and appreciates in a way that they certainly do not. And now as he comes toward the present, he brings this history galloping through the periods of Joshua and David and Solomon. Three things to consider. First of all, the tabernacle or the tent, if you want to be even blunter about it. Tabernacle can sound very grand, but it's probably worth remembering that we're talking here about a tent. So the tabernacle or the tent, then the temple, and then the treachery. Tabernacle, temple, and treachery. What had happened in the wilderness? The people did not offer slaughtered animals and sacrifices, but they took up the tabernacle or the tent of Moloch and the star of your god Remphan, images which you made to worship, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. And the striking contrast as we get into verse 44, our fathers had the tabernacle of witness, the tent of testimony in the wilderness as God appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which our fathers, having received that tabernacle in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David who found favour before God and asked to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob. Do you see the contrast there? You asked for the tabernacle of Moloch when you had with you the tabernacle of testimony. You went after false gods when God himself had made himself manifest in your presence. God himself gave to Moses the heavenly pattern for that tabernacle when Moses was on the mountain. You have that in Exodus chapter 25, and it's emphasized again in Hebrews and chapter 8. And this tabernacle, this tent, which in its design, its particular dimensions, symbolized the presence of the heavenly God with his people upon earth, this was described in Exodus 27 as the meeting place it was the tent of meeting. It had within it the word of God. Everything about this tabernacle declared that God himself 
had made a way in which it would appear to his people that he was in their midst. There was, a, as it were, a reflection of heaven upon earth that was meant to communicate to the wilderness generation that the God of heaven and earth was with them and among them. And they asked for Moloch's tent. And they made an image of a gold calf. And they raged against the God who provided them with food and drink in the wilderness. Israel was an ungrateful nation. And despite the fact that they disdained the presence of God with them, God remained faithful and merciful to them in accordance with his promises. He did not withdraw from them, but the tabernacle was with them and went with them into the promised land. God went on leading them. Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 5. You have this constant emphasis that God through the wilderness and into the land of promise went before them. You shall seek the place where the Lord your God chooses out of all the tribes to put his name for his dwelling place and there you shall go. You are to drive out the false gods from the land into which I take you. And under Joshua, Stephen summarizes it. God drove out the idolaters before the face of our fathers until the days of David. So all through the wilderness, notice, before they even came to the promised land. Remember one of the emphases of the Sanhedrin has been, we have God with us, the promised land is where God is, and because we're in the promised land and we have the temple, we have God. Stephen's saying, remember that there was a tabernacle in the wilderness. And God was with you there. And there were times when you seemed to have very little regard for God's presence with you. But there's something else to bear in mind here. I think, I don't think we read it this morning, but in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1, what does Paul, what language does the apostle use to emphasize something that is passing away, something that is only temporary or transient? He talks about his body as a tent. Or a tabernacle. God gave his people a tent. Now it was a true symbol of his presence with them. A symbol. A true symbol. But a temporary symbol. Tents don't last. And in the very fact that the Lord gave to Moses. A heavenly pattern for a tent, there's probably at least for those who have eyes to see it, a reminder that these things must pass away because tents don't last. See what I mean? So Stephen's learned to read the Old Testament in the light of the New Testament. When you see tents in the Old Testament, do you instinctively go, well, that won't last? Stephen thought that even about the temple of God when he reviewed the Old Testament. It's as if he says, shouldn't we have known that the things which belong to this dispensation were passing away? Yes, God was with his people. God was with his people wherever they were, when they were on the move, when they were in the wilderness. God was with them. But he was with them in a tent. That brings us to a temple. Verse 47, David had wanted to find a dwelling for the house of God, but Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands, as the prophet says, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things?' 
So Israel is now no longer wandering. God has brought them into the promised land. The peoples have been driven out under the, uh, the leadership of Joshua. The days of the judges are now over. And David, a man who finds favour with God, has been raised up and seated on the throne. And it is David who asks to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob. Now that's recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 7. The precise language is in the, uh, the record of that in Psalm 132, where David, speaking of his desires toward the end of that psalm, 132 and verse... I don't think it's going to be 48... I've got the wrong psalm here. But there's a place where David uses that precise language and says, I, I want to build a dwelling place. I've asked to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob. And you may remember that the Lord said to David, you're not going to build me a house because you are a man of blood. Your history uh, disqualifies you from that purpose. Now, it's at least worth noting that God gave Moses the heavenly template for the tabernacle, but David asked if he could build a house. We might not want to make too much of this because the Lord doesn't say to David, that is a terrible idea, how dare you suggest it? But it's perhaps noticeable that there is a shift here away from the transience of the tent to the permanence of the temple imagined permanence of the temple that comes more from men than from God. So possibly a hint of negativity, certainly a potential danger that needs to be taken account of. And remember that Solomon himself took account of the danger when the temple was built. In 1 Kings and chapter 8, when Solomon builds the temple, and Solomon's temple was a most glorious construction. As Solomon prays, he says things like this, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens cannot contain you. How much less this temple which I have built. And again in verse 30. May you hear the supplication of your servant and of your people Israel when they play toward this place. Here, not in the temple, but here in heaven, your dwelling place. And when you hear, forgive. It's as if Solomon is conscious that the magnificence of the temple and its apparent permanence could suggest that somehow God is tied to a particular place. Now, it's not that the tabernacle lacked glory. You read the description of that in Exodus and the thing must have been splendid to behold. But it was manifestly something that travelled around with the people. Solomon, now that there is this permanent building, he is saying, Lord, we know that you cannot be tied to a place. Your dwelling is in heaven. You cannot be contained by something which man has built. Now, what is interesting is that Stephen doesn't quote Solomon to make that point. Stephen quotes God himself. God's challenge in Isaiah and chapter 66. This is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you will build me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things my hand has made and all those things exist. Stephen introduces the God who speaks here as the Most High. He is emphasising the divine majesty. He is making sure that we understand that the God of whom we speak here is the transcendent God. 
It's the name that is revealed in, in Genesis chapter 14. It's the name that is used right at the beginning of Luke's gospel when we're emphasizing the fact that God Most High has drawn near in the person of his Son. It's a name that emphasizes the untouchable highness of the great and glorious God, the immeasurable greatness of the infinite, eternal, and unchangeable sovereign of all the earth. The Most High, of course he doesn't dwell in temples made with hands. Who could imagine that the God of all the earth could be constrained and confined and packed down to a building, however great and glorious and golden that building might be? Who would be fool enough to imagine that you could somehow restrain God's presence? The God who spoke to Moses in the back parts of the wilderness. The God who called Abraham out of the Ur, out of Ur of the Chaldees. The God who preserved and cared for Joseph when he was in Egypt. The God who led his people through the wilderness and thrust the idolaters out of the promised land. You think you're going to anchor him to a place? You think you're going to tie him down to a building? Heaven is my throne, earth my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? Is the creator of all going to dwell in a handmade house? Is the cre creator going to be tied down to a creature's creation? The question, the tone of it, exposes the, the nonsensical suggestion. Heaven is my throne. What is your temple compared to the glorious residence of the Most High? Solomon himself says, Lord, here in heaven your dwelling place. Earth is my footstool. The scale of these things ought to emphasize the, the, the insanity of thinking that somehow God can be boiled down, condensed, that the essence of divinity is somehow obliged to be in a particular place and therefore under somehow the control of a particular people. God is not limited to one place. God is not anchored to one particular structure and Israel has made the error of assuming that what they think is a permanent building somehow guarantees the permanent presence of God with them even though this is Herod's temple this is the second temple they're rebuilding it again see God is with us God is for us we have the temple this is where God lives and he lives with us and he doesn't live with you it's not God who is most high in their estimation they're the ones who are holding the reins they're the ones who control access to God they're the ones who control the flow of blessing from God to men what was the accusation made against Stephen You speak as if this temple doesn't matter very much. You speak as if this temple does not have the significance which we have ascribed to it. Me, says Stephen, you should hear what God says about the temple. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord, or what is the place of of my rest. It is God himself who taught the transience of the tabernacle and the insignificance, relatively speaking, of the temple. Now, if God's design was for a fading tent, and if God himself made clear <laughs> 
that any building, no matter how outwardly great, could never contain his glorious being. Then can there be any truth to the charge of blasphemy about the destruction of the temple? God himself foreshadowed it. God himself exposed the temple and its inadequacies. Here's the tantalizing hint. What did Isaiah go on to say in Isaiah 66? Because Stephen quotes the first verse as we have it in our Bible and the first half of the second verse. The Lord says, On this one will I look. I am not obliged to you by the presence of your temple. I will look kindly upon the one who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my word. I dwell in a temple not made with hands. I dwell in what we might call a circumcised heart. I dwell with the humble man, with the broken hearted man, with the spiritually sensitive man. That is where you will find me. Those are where you will find me. I wonder if Stephen had finished his sermon he might have got into Isaiah 66, verse 2, part B. Calvin says, just as an aside, no harm can be done to the temple and the law when Christ is openly established as the end and truth of both. Stephen's not against the law. Stephen's not against the temple. Stephen understands the law. Stephen appreciates the temple for what it was but he recognises what it isn't and was never meant to be. And that's why we now come to the treachery. And it's not a sudden change of direction. It's not an abrupt and unexpected assault. It flows very naturally from all of the things that Stephen has been saying up to this point. He has been accused of blasphemy against the law and the temple. And now the accused accuses his accusers. Stephen has reached a pitch of holy grief and righteous indignation at these men who have made themselves the arbiters of God's truth and presence without ever truly submitting to that truth or understanding that divine presence. Who are the blasphemers here? Not Stephen and the other believers, but these Sanhedrin Jews. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. Stephen now seems to speak with the very words and in the spirit of an Old Testament prophet. And he's bringing the reality of new covenant truth to bear upon these sinners. They are stiff-necked. This is language that was used in Exodus chapter 33. Language that was used in Deuteronomy chapter 9. It's graphic language doesn't mean someone who can't quite turn their head in that direction because they slept on the pillow funny. It means someone who will not bow. You might have seen it, not just in little children, but in grown-ups. When someone is being called to account and you can almost see them, they set their jaw and they put their head up. I will not take this. I'm not backing down. I will not bow to you. I will not submit before you. 
And Stephen says, that's what's going on in your heart. That's what you're showing in the way that you listen. And you uncircumcised in heart. This is language found in Judges chapter 14. It's something that Jeremiah addresses in chapter 6 and verse 10. To be uncircumcised in heart is to be a pagan. It is to be apart from God. Now these Sanhedrin Jews, they have absolutely prided themselves on their circumcision in the flesh. We the sons of Abraham, we the followers of Moses, we the inheritors of the covenant, we the keepers of the law and of the temple, you uncircumcised in heart and ears, says Stephen. You do not know the God that you profess. You have no sense of his presence with you. You have no regard for the law which he has bestowed upon you and you can see similar charges Leviticus Jeremiah Deuteronomy Ezekiel all the way into Romans when Paul says some of the same things Stephen his soul stirred by the blindness and the rebellion of these Sanhedrin Jews identifies without restraint their insensitivity to truth and their hostility to God. You have pagan souls, says Stephen, who boast of being the keepers of the law and the temple and who dare to accuse the followers of Jesus Christ of blasphemy against God Most High. You belong to Israel indeed. You belong to the Israel of the Old Covenant. You belong to the people who ignored what they had and who presumed what they lacked. When Jesus Christ died and the veil of the temple was torn in two, there was no Shekinah glory in the holiest place. Symbolically, we now had a way to where God dwells. Not in this shabby temple of yours, but in the temple that is made without hands that is eternal in the heavens. That's what is real. God has spoken to us in these days by his Son. God has presenced himself amongst us in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. And you are the men who resist the Holy Spirit. There's a shift here. Notice what Stephen says. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Now Stephen has not used that language up to this point, if you remember. Up to this point when he's talking about a common and shared history, it's been our fathers, our fathers. For we are all Israel according to the flesh at least. But now Stephen is driving home the distinction that always existed, even in Old Covenant Israel, between those who merely had circumcision according to the flesh and those who were circumcised in the heart. The remnant of God, the people who were faithful to him and who held fast to the promises all through those centuries. Those are your fathers, says Stephen. They're not mine. Your spiritual descendants of the people who always resisted the Holy Spirit. Again, in Isaiah chapter 63, you'll see what Stephen has in mind in verses 9 and 10. In all their affliction, the Saviour was afflicted. The angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them and he bore them and carried them all the days of old. God, by his Spirit, was with his people in the wilderness but they rebelled and grieved his spirit and he turned against them as an enemy and he fought against them. That's still you, says Stephen. That's still your disposition. You are the men who when you had the Messiah of God amongst you and saw him in his compassion and his power, healing the sick and casting out demons by the power of the Holy Ghost. You're the men who said, ah, he's casting out demons by demons. This is the man who's got Beelzebul within him. That was when the Lord Jesus said, you are blaspheming whom? 
the Holy Spirit. You are ascribing the power of God to demons. You are of your fathers who always resisted the Spirit. It's a persistent pattern. You always resisted the Holy Spirit. And you've shown it too because you've persecuted the prophets. <clears throat> Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And these are the ones who told you before about the coming of the just one. Second Chronicles chapter 36. I'm not saying the Sanhedrin don't know this, but Stephen certainly does. He's not a man ignorant with regard to the Old Testament. The Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to his people by his messengers, rising up early and sending them, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked the messengers of God. This is 2 Chronicles 36, 15 and 16. They mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets, until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no remedy. And what had Stephen's saviour said? You take care of the tombs of the prophets your fathers killed. And it's as if you're saying we agree with what they did. You still didn't listen. John the Baptist came. Messiah's last forerunner. Preparing a way in the wilderness. Making ready the road for the king of kings. And he was preaching repentance in the wilderness. And he was baptising all who came penitent to him. And you asked, what do we need? And John warned you. And while the Roman soldiers and the tax collectors were being baptised for the forgiveness of their sins, you were standing aside, you brood of vipers. You killed those who told you about the righteous one, the just one. And when he came, you betrayed and murdered him. In Luke chapter 20. The Lord Jesus told the people a parable. A certain man planted a vineyard leased it to vine dressers, went into a far country for a long time. At vintage time he sent a servant to the vine dressers that they might give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the vine dressers beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Again he sent another servant and they beat him also, treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And again he sent a third and they wounded him also and cast him out. The prophets who foretold the coming of the just one you persecuted and killed. Then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Probably they will respect him when they see him. But when the vine dressers saw him, they reasoned among themselves saying, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him that the inheritance may be ours. So they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do to them? Stephen's not saying something new here. When Peter preached in Solomon's porch, you denied the Holy One and the just, and you asked for a murderer to be granted to you. You killed the Prince of Life whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. Or as John puts it very simply, He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. You, says Stephen, you were unjust to the just one. 
You who pride yourselves on your righteousness, you behaved unrighteously towards God's righteous man. You betrayed him and you murdered the Lord of glory. So you reject the law. You received it by the law, the law by the direction of angels, but you have not kept it. The, the fact that the law came by angelic ministry is hinted at in Deuteronomy 33. It's made much clearer in Galatians 3 verse 19 and Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 2. Stephen's point here is that the law came to you from heaven. It was carried to you in a glorious demonstration of divine power and truth. Everything about its grant to your hero Moses should have communicated to you the sanctity and the purity of God's holy law. It should have pointed you toward Jesus Christ. It should have exposed your sins. It should have humbled you before God. It should have emphasised your need of a true mediator, a better man than Moses himself. Moses pointed to this Jesus. And here you are, the defenders of the law, who acknowledge it outwardly, but rebel inwardly. If you were law men, would you have treated Jesus of Nazareth the way you treated him? With your false accusations and your lies and your alliances with the Herodians and with the Romans. With the fact, for example, that when this Jesus performed his deeds of mercy on the Sabbath day, you were so angry with the way that he used the Sabbath day that you plotted to murder him on the Sabbath day. Do you not see your hypocrisy? Do you not see your inconsistency? You are the men who have always resisted the Holy Spirit. You stand where your fathers stood. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who foretold the coming of the just one. And you still will not hear the word of God's messengers. And that just one, when he finally came, you betrayed him and you murdered him. You who boast in the law. You who boast in the temple, you do not recognise God when he speaks. And you do not know what it has is to have God with you. You reject God's word. You hate God's presence. You despise his preachers. You and those like you always did. And you still do. Not a one of them says, no, Stephen, I think you've got this all wrong. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. What clearer proof do you need that Stephen had put his finger on the issue? You hate it when God speaks to you and you do not know what it is to have God with you. You had the living word of God in your presence and you put him to death. And Stephen stands as a messenger of Jesus Christ and a preacher of the new covenant. And he lays before them how God in all his dealings with Israel of old had in fact been emphasizing the very things that they have been denying. And how the history of old covenant Israel is a history not of delight in the law and reverence for the presence of God, but of evasion and rebellion and disdain. There is no one more infuriated by God's good news than those whose religion is outward only.
You want to make someone angry. Tell a religious person, a shell Christian, that they are a sinner who needs to repent and believe in Jesus Christ. The angriest people that I have ever had to deal with in this and other congregations have been people who desperately wanted everybody to think that they were the good guys and who could not and would not abide being told that they deserved hell apart from Jesus Christ. Thank God that we are not Sanhedrin Jews. But take care that you don't act like them. You have your Bibles and you have your chapels. God has spoken to us. We surely are the faithful people. We know what God has said and we know where God is. It is all too easy for us still to believe that somehow God has an obligation to us and we have a reign upon him. The question is not first, where's your big chunky Bible? And where's your lovely dissenting chapel? It is this, my friends, lest Stephen's charge sticks upon your soul also. Do I have a humble head? And do I have a circumcised heart? You can sit here this evening applauding Stephen with a stiff a neck and as pagan a heart as any Pharisee. May God spare us such pride. With whom does God dwell? Not in cathedrals and not in chapels but with churches. He was with Abraham when he found him in Ur of the Chaldees. He guided him in all his wanderings and never left him. When Joseph was sold into slavery in Egypt, God was there with him. God spoke to him. When Moses was cast out of Egypt, did God abandon him? Or did God go with him? When God called Moses and made himself known in the bush that burned but was not consumed, was God somehow restrained by a place in the promised land? When his people went out of Egypt and wandered for 40 years in the wilderness, could God not keep up with them? No, God showed by his tabernacle that he was with them as they wended their way through the desert and God went with them into the promised land. And there David wanted to build a temple, but it was Solomon who established a house. But what folly it would be to think that somehow God has yoked himself to a place. No, God has committed himself to a people. To those who are of a broken and a contrite heart and who tremble at his word. And while you are such a person and while we are such a people, God remains such a God. It is him whom we need. Not a mere reputation for godliness externally, but a heart that bows to God. And that delights in the just one, the prince of life, slain for sinners like us.